One of the things that I love is that two films idea of your life. And there's like two stories you can tell. One that is safe and full of regret, and one that is risky and full of pride and joy. So the story that I want to share with you all starts here. This is my parents' farm in the middle of nowhere in North Yorkshire and where I grew up. And when I lived there, I was inducted into a very specific form of doing. It was the muck-shoveling, hard work form of doing. Uh, because my parents had no qualms whatsoever with the concept of child labour. When you became three in my family, it was a really, really big milestone. Because not only could you walk, much more importantly than that, you could carry a bucket. So you were useful and you were enrolled into the workforce. So I then spent 21 years of my life here, and that was where I learned just how much hard work goes into producing the food that we all eat every day. After going to university, I uh, graduated and I went to London. And there I encountered a very different form of doing, which involved no muck whatsoever. Um, and by all estimates, I had what could be called a, a very successful career. But there was one problem with it. I used to think, and this might sound a bit weird, but I can remember thinking, if I were to die tomorrow, I would not be proud of what I've achieved. And I'd come to events that were not dissimilar to this one, and I was finding myself getting increasingly frustrated, sitting in the audience, listening to people on the stage, and being so inspired by their stories. And I'd look at myself, and I was not inspired by my own at all. Now, that all changed four and a half years ago, where I had a seemingly insignificant moment take place in my life. So I was living in Geneva with my husband Simon and my two kids, Archie and Charlie, who are four and six. You've probably seen them running around. I promised I'd give them a shout out. So we were living in Geneva, uh, and we were moving back to the UK. Now, somehow, I seem to have drawn the short straw, which was that on moving day, I was in Geneva having to pack up the whole apartment with a newborn baby and a toddler, and my husband Simon had the tough job of waiting for us in the UK. <laughs> it was an important job, people. So packing day, as you can all imagine, stressful, newborn baby, toddler. We got into the kitchen. The removal men said to me, we have to throw away all of this food. And I was like, what? Wait a minute. No, no, that's not happening. Um, and in particular, I was very aggrieved about the fact that we had this sort of enormous, perfectly shrink-wrapped cabbage, you know, the type that will kind of last forever, six sweet potatoes. Um, and I was just not going to throw them in the bin. And so much the irritation of the packing men, I stopped packing, packed up Archie and Charlie, which for those of you who kids will know will take a good 45 minutes. I get out of the house, clutching this food, um, and I knew where I was going to go. There was a lady who was always outside the supermarket who was asking for money. And I do not know why, but on that day, she wasn't there. Um, I got a little over-emotional. I will acknowledge I shed a few tears. It was probably sort of post-baby stuff. Um, but I got very emotional about the fact that I'd gone to all this effort to share this food, and I'd failed. And so I went back to my apartment, um, and I'm stubborn and not to be defeated. So when the removal men weren't looking, I smuggled the non-perishable food into the bottom of my packing boxes. And at that moment, I thought, I am probably performing a criminal offence. And I'm a good girl. I do not want to do this. But to me, it was equally criminal to put that perfectly good food in the rubbish bin. And I knew there was an app for absolutely everything. And I thought, why isn't there an app where I can just advertise that I have this food and someone who's living nearby can pop around and pick it up? And I was stunned to discover that no such app existed. So once I'd pitched this idea of an app that connects neighbours to share food to my co-founder, Sasha, the first thing that we did was to research the problem of food waste. And what we discovered shocked and horrified us. Globally, a third of all the food we produce gets thrown away each year. That's worth over $1.2 trillion dollars. But it's not just the food that's being thrown away. It's the land, the labor, the water, the packaging, the manufacturing, the shipping, the distribution. All of those resources are being thrown away. And alongside that widespread waste, we have unconscionable levels of hunger in this world. There are 800 million people who go to bed hungry every night. That's one in nine of us. 
and they could be fed on a quarter of the food that we waste in the Western world. Now, looking at the previous photo, it's easy to assume that hunger is a problem that's taking place somewhere else. And I will hold my hand up. On this journey, I have been horrified to discover that hunger is alive and kicking. It's rampant even in this country, here in the UK. And I know we've got lots of American colleagues here as well. Sadly, it's the same in America too. So in the UK, we have 8.4 million people living in food poverty, which for reference is equivalent to the size of the population of London. And one in two of those people are living in severe food poverty, which means they do not know where their next meal is going to come from. So we've got widespread food waste, we've got widespread hunger, and as if that wasn't bad enough, food waste is nothing short of an environmental travesty. Every year, a landmass larger than China is used to grow food that is never eaten. It then goes on that incredibly long supply chain, and it ends up in landfill. And when food waste decomposes without access to oxygen, it gives off methane, 25 times more deadly than CO2. And so that is why, if food waste were to be a country, it would be the third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions after the USA and China. Food waste, third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions after USA and China. Um, and sorry, guys, the doom and gloom continues for a few more slides. Uh, it picks up soon, I promise. Um, that's where we are today. Now let's look forward to the future. This is a chart showing the global population. It starts going really crazy um, around about the 1950s. We have another 2.2 billion people joining our planet by 2050. And in order to feed us all, we need to increase global food production by 50%. And today, we have no idea how we're going to achieve that. So what that means is that we are on the cusp of moving from living in a world where we have far too much food for everybody. We are awash with food right now. To living in a world in which there is no longer enough food to feed us all. And perhaps the most shocking fact of all was for us to discover that in countries like the UK, the US, the Western world, but increasingly globally, well over half of all food waste takes place in the home. This is in contrast to the retailers and the supermarkets who at a store level here in the UK are responsible for less than 5% of all food waste. So how are we responsible for half of all food waste? That's because there are 28 million homes in the UK and we are all throwing away a quarter of our weekly shop. And that collectively adds up to 15 billion pounds worth of food or hard economic labor that is ending up in landfill. And so what that means is that we, and I mean all of us, each and every one of us, we are half of this problem. But if you flip that on its head, it means that we can be half the solution. And suddenly, this starts to get really, really exciting. So the first thing that Sash and I wanted to do before throwing our life savings into building an app that perhaps no one would even want or use, we thought we'd better do some research. So we'd done the market research, and we thought, let's see um, how many people care about this problem of food waste. It's clearly a big problem on paper. Will that translate um, to them caring? So we sent out a market research survey. We had just under 400 uh, people respond. And we were thrilled to discover that one in three people said that they were physically pained throwing away good food. And we used deliberately extreme language to get away from the, yeah, it's bad. One in three people were physically pained throwing away good food. So we were thrilled. We were like, we're not the only weirdos. This is clearly a mainstream problem. But just because people said they were physically pained throwing away good food did not mean to say they would take the next step in our hypothesis, which is to share that food with a stranger. How could we test that without building a very, very expensive app? What we did was we asked 12 people who said, I hate throwing away food, and they all lived close to one another, and we put them on a closed WhatsApp group. And for two weeks, we said, if you have any food to share, here's a group. And these were all strangers. None of them had met each other. We hadn't met any of them either. And we waited with bated breath for the first, I think it was about 48 
agonizing hours. And then someone shared some food. And you can see it here. Half a net of shallots. Now, we were doing the, uh, the experiment up in Crouch End in North London. So those of you who know Crouch End will know that's a very Crouch End uh, listing, shallots. <laughs> um, and that half a net of shallots was requested in 23 minutes. So we were absolutely thrilled. We then, at the end of the two weeks, met with these people. It was really weird. We'd never met them before. We met in coffee shops all over North London. We said, thank you so much for taking part in our really weird experiment. And we asked them for their feedback. And they said to us a couple of things. One, you have to build this. Two, it only needs to be slightly better than a WhatsApp group. And three, most importantly, how can I help? So... Armed with that sort of information and inspiration, we took the leap and we did invest our life savings into building Olio. And I thought it would be helpful now just to explain sort of how it works for those of you who haven't taken part. So let's imagine that you are going away for a weekend, perhaps coming to a festival in a shed in Wales, and you might have some beautiful juicy tomatoes that you don't want. You simply snap a photo of your tomatoes, add them to your app, neighbours living nearby can browse the listings, request what they want, and then they pop round and pick it up. And what is most amazing about this is that half of all the food added to the app is requested in less than one hour. So the demand for this food is off the charts. So we launched the pilot version of Olio in the summer of 2015, five small postcodes in North London. We spent about six months um, in pilot mode, doing lots of stuff that doesn't scale, literally pounding the pavements. Um, and I'm really, really happy to say that through you know, three years now of hard blood, sweat, tears, and some, uh, just over a month ago, we passed a million people having joined Olio. And the real magic of the app actually is not just about sort of saving food, although clearly we've saved an enormous amount of food. Those people have together shared two million portions of food, and that is the environmental equivalent of taking five million car miles off the road. So we have barely even started. We're doing 0.001% of our potential, and already we've taken five million car miles off the road. But the real magic is what happens when two people who are strangers meet in real life. That is the magic. Because I've also learned on this journey that whilst we are more connected than we've ever been before, we're simultaneously lonelier than we've ever been before. Did you know that there are nine million people in the UK who say that they are always or often lonely? And so what we're doing here is we are directly combating that by connecting people in real life to build friendships and to build relationships. And we wouldn't have achieved any of this um, were it not for our 35,000 brand ambassadors. So these are people who are passionate about Olio, passionate about our mission, and we have equipped them with posters, letters, flyers, and they are spreading the word about Olio in their local community. And as a result of these phenomenal people, we've had food successfully shared in 49 countries so far. And so as we look to the future, our vision for Olio is an unashamedly bold one. We want a billion people using Olio within the next 10 years. And that's not just because we want it. That is because, without wanting to put too fine a point on it, the world needs us to achieve that. But Olio isn't just about preventing food waste. It's about preventing waste and sustainable living more generally. So I don't know how many of you here in the audience have heard of Earth Overshoot Day. <coughs> hands up if you've heard of it. Couple of hands. So well done, you guys. Um, for those of you who haven't heard about it, um, Earth Overshoot Day is the day in the year in which humanity has used up all of the resources that the Earth can replenish in a year. When it was first measured in the late 60s and early 70s, Earth Overshoot Day was the 31st of December. So what that means is that back then, humanity lived in equilibrium with the planet. We used up in a year what the planet could replenish. Last year, Earth Overshoot Day was the 1st of August. This year, Earth Overshoot Day is in a minute. It's on the 29th of July. And I don't want to sort of <laughs> labour this point too much, but what this means is that every single thing, that every single one of us, seven and a half billion people, in a minute, 10 billion people, every single thing that we consume after the 29th of August 
Jai, sorry, is net net depletive to the planet. Another way of cutting this data is to say, how many planets would we need if the whole of the Earth's population lived like a typical American? And the answer is five. We would need five planets if we all lived like a typical American. Don't get smug Brits. It's not looking good for us either. Um, how many planets would we need if we all lived like a typical Brit? Three. How many planets are we living as if we have right now? 1.7. News alert, we do not have 1.7 planets. So clearly, this is not sustainable. And so I'm very excited, though. I know, obviously, a lot of what I've shared sounds like some horrific sort of dystopian nightmare that sadly is our reality. Um, but I'm starting to get really, really excited because we're starting to talk about this stuff. Uh, and talk leads to action. And so we see that the IPCC said we have 12 years left to avert catastrophic climate change. The United Nations says that we are, you know, million species are at risk of extinction. We have people like Sir David Attenborough talking about, and I quote, the collapse of civilization. So you might be sitting here thinking, wow, that all sounds a bit intense. What can I possibly do? What can I do to make a difference? And I would suggest that there is a lot that we can all do. The first is to think. Every single time that you spend a pound, that is a vote. You can either vote for the status quo, you can vote for this unsustainable world that we currently live in, or you can take your money and you can vote for a future. Every pound that you spend is a vote. And if you think about it that way, then suddenly we are incredibly powerful because the cumulative effect of millions and millions of small votes is massive transformational change. The second thing that I would uh, encourage everybody to do is to uh, reimagine, rethink our relationship with consumption. So there's a brilliant book by a lady called Bea Johnson um, called A Zero Waste Home, and this is a hierarchy that she steps out to help you think about how you consume. And at the very top of that hierarchy is refuse. We are offered free stuff and stuff that we don't want or need the whole time. The whole time. And out of politeness and courtesy, etc., we accept that stuff. We need to start politely saying no thank you. The next thing that we need to do is just reduce. Reduce our overall consumption. Did you know that the average American home has 300,000 things in it? And we're not far behind, right? We've just got to reduce our rate of consumption. And then after that, it's reuse. And this is where Olio really steps in. So we are connecting neighbors not only to share food, but also we've got a rapidly growing non-food section. Toiletries, cosmetics, light bulbs, kitchen equipment, books, clothes, toys stuff that we have in our home that is the world's precious resources that should be liberated by giving them to a neighbor who really wants or even needs them. We then have recycle. Um, recycling is great, don't get me wrong, but the way I think about recycling is that it's marginally better than landfill. Why is that? Because it is such an energy intensive process. And for everything that we sort of recycle, in our homes, another 50 to 70 tonnes of waste has been generated up the supply chain. And the majority, sadly, of what we put in our recycling bins, it turns out, doesn't actually even get recycled. So recycling should be done, but it's marginally better than landfill. And at the very bottom of this hierarchy is rot, hopefully in compost. And so um, just to wrap up now, I just wanted to share with you all um, a really profound realization that I had recently, which is that this is a war. This is a war, and our children, sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> our children are going to ask each and every one of us, where were we during the war? And so I encourage you all to take inspiration from the words of Dr. Jane Goodall as you think about where were you during the war. If you look at the whole picture, it is overwhelming but terrifying. But if you work on your little part of the jigsaw and know that people all over the world are working on their little parts, then that is what will give you hope. Thank you.